I always uh, felt that uh, I was trained in an era where there were not too many investigations. And then came an era where a lot of investigations came in and uh, we tried to learn them, but we were far behind because we had not learned them right from the basics. And then I'm glad to hear Dr. Jain today to say that even the neonatologists have gone back to only a clinical observation. And I'm glad I didn't learn much about investigations because it would have been waste of learning. And uh, I'm back again where I was. Uh, I'm sure investigations are useful, but done at a very proper time. And uh, just now we saw a first child that he presented where tuberculin tests, I wondered why were the tests done at all. And because the test was done, everything went wrong thereafter. So the tests have taught us probably when not to do them. And I'm sure today in the city of Bombay, when CT scan centers are available more frequently than the physicians, uh, <laughs> you have just to have a brain uh, and a CT scan is available there and you have to have a money and then you produce something that you start wondering what it is. <clears throat> I think I'll just take you through the whole gamut of pediatrics. And uh, I, I have been always blamed to make a pediatric simple, but I thought that's the aim of the whole uh, CME that we all know pediatrics and medicine is complex, but when we try to practice, we want to make it simple so that 90% we don't make a mistake. And you'll be happy to know that 10% everybody else is also making a mistake. So uh, the whole idea of this basics is to be more often right than wrong. And I'm sure you cannot be always right. And that is what we learn over time. But to begin with, let's be confident that such basics work. And only when you try to put them into your practice, you start realizing to fine tune where they don't work. And I can assure you, they don't work only rarely. They work mostly. <clears throat> and therefore, I'll just take you quickly through all that. I think fever is so common. To me, no fever is no acute infection and no antibiotic. I would almost never give an antibiotic to a child who has no fever. Well, exceptions are there. Chronic infections often have no fever, but where is the hurry to diagnose chronic infection? And it can wait, and the diagnosis is not easy. So anyway, we would rather wait for chronic infection to be without fever, needing an antibiotic, but in general, therefore, no fever is no antibiotic. I think if you have a cough without fever, don't give an antibiotic. If you have a diarrhea without fever, Malti said, blood mucus, high fever, toxic, maybe, but not otherwise. And I think it's not a bad idea to say no fever is no antibiotic. Well, fever may not mean every time an antibiotic. And the question comes, how do you differentiate viral from bacterial and uh, the thing? Can I have a pointer? <clears throat> uh, and I'm sure it's not easy. But I must say also that it's, it's not difficult uh, in majority of the situation. You can't be 200% sure. And you are not sure even at the end of all investigations. And to that extent, uh, I feel this is very, very useful to me. Uh, unfortunately, I was not born uh, in an era like Dr. Jain and not trained in the great institutes. Those were the days when there was nothing like evidence. There was an experience. And the masters talked and we students listened. And we took them as a gospel truth. Today we know that not all masters were right all the time. And there is a need to be masters being checked, validated. And imagine a wonderful talk that Dr. Jain gave, talked also about a clinical application which was validated. I'm sure nothing that we did, we tried to validate. And I understand uh, the limitations of all these observations. But I would only now know that somebody else takes forward and try to validate it. And a person like Dr. Jain who validated his statement said that if there was any other opinion, he would be open to correction. And I'm sure such statements that I make are very, very open to correction. But where will we start? Probably we'll start here and then try to apply whether uh, those things apply reasonably correctly. To me, most of the viral infections start as a high fever at the onset. But by day three, day four, they are already getting better. What's the message? You may have to wait for day three, day four to know where you go along with the fever. And of course, by then you have ruled out the serious conditions. And how? what serious conditions? Only few in clinical pediatrics presenting with acute fever. You want to rule out pneumonia. Oh, simple, tachypnea chest retraction. That's my pneumonia. 
you want to rule out meningitis, early meningitis. Just a behavior disturbance, either drowsy, lethargic, irritable child. And then you want to rule out sepsis or disproportionate tachycardia and tachypnea, much before even a delayed capillary refill and shock comes in. And you want to rule out a diphtheria. That's it. No other acute fever ever kills anyone. You might kill him because you did something wrong. You just rule out few common conditions that I mentioned and then wait. And I think also look at a febrile state. Here is a mother who said, 103 fever every time, doctor. I said, what happens after paracetamol? Oh, the fever comes down by 2 degrees and child is so active, playful, nobody believes he is sick. Oh, that's my viral infection. Many bacterial infection children continue to be sick, even interfebrile. Malaria is an erratic fever. Add to that a cold and cough and diarrhea and vomiting, it becomes simple viral. And what bacterial infection you can diagnose on first 3-4 days? Can you diagnose typhoid fever in the first 3-4 days? No. And can you suspect a UTI? Maybe. You might do a urinalysis, but not give an antibiotic. And I feel that this kind of an approach to fever would be very good. And then of course, as I have already said, rule out an intracranial infection, a pneumonia, maybe a falciparum or malaria. And to that extent, if you investigate only after day 3-4, Majority of the times you won't have to investigate at all because the child is either clear, normal, or you have already a diagnosis. And to that extent, then we do a CBC. Uh, some of you might have seen this slide. I, I think uh, it's useless to go by total count of polys and lymphos because the total counts are high in acute bacterial infection. They could be high in viral too, and they are very high in a systemic inflammatory response. They are high in leukemia too. Even then it's unfortunate that when the counts are high, you think it's a need for an antibiotic. And you have a typhoid which has a low count. So low counts also don't rule out an acute infection. And then you have chronic infections like TB and all, which don't give any clue at all. But what gives clue maybe is the hemoglobin, eosinophils and the platelets. Look at eosinophils. Most of the acute infections have a suppressed eosinophils and most of the other conditions have maintained eosinophils or even sometimes higher. And look at the platelets, how a low platelet could be in typhoid, acute viral infection, of course any capillary leak, malaria, high platelets in systemic inflammatory disease, and then of course the hemoglobin, maybe a capillary leak there, and a malaria there, and a leukemia there. I'm sure I, I, as an undergraduate 50 years ago, I was impressed by total count polys and lymphos, least realizing they were useless. And to me now far more important are eosinophil platelet and hemoglobin. And surely you look at them, don't discard them, but don't go by them at all. And that's how they go by. Cough is very, very common. And I think some of the statements that I make are to be taken with caution because they are not 100% right, but they are mostly right. Uh, I'm, I like to make a statement, more you cough, lesser you ask for an x-ray chest. And I'm sure most of the time when you have... Uh, taken a chest x-ray in a child who coughs badly, pr prominent symptom, predominant symptom of cough, and you have produced an x-ray in which you find abnormalities which are not there. I'm sure a small atelectatic segment is called pneumonitis. I do not know from where this term came in, because pneumonia is an inflammation of a lung parenchyma, and of that inflammation is pneumonitis. Pneumonitis is inflammation of pneumonia. Now, I don't know from where it has come. It only conveys to me that the radiologist is confused and not very sure. And the clinician, as you and me, are already confused. Double confusion. Don't ask for that. And I think largely, if the cough is a predominant problem, it's an airway disease. Alveolar and pleural diseases cough very little. Predominant symptoms are different. When you look at the fever, many airway diseases have fever which is not predominant. The only condition with fever and a very bad cough is a viral infection, very commonly. Of course, sometimes an atypical uh, pneumonia like mycoplasma and so on would have a significant fever and cough. Let's think about that a little later than primarily. And I'm sure today we diagnose mycoplasma pneumonia clinically when a simple low respiratory tract febrile illness which is going on for a long time and has not got better with simple amoxicillin is probably a mycoplasma for a clinician and a trial with a macrolide would be worth it. And therefore, barring such thing, well, many, many airways are recurrent. Look at a common viral infection with wheeze, a wheeze-associated low respiratory tract infection, 
or an asthma or an aspiration or an allergy, whatever. Many airways problems are often recurrent and the chest signs are generalized. I'm sure you may not now be able to pick up a good bronchial breathing or whatever. And gone are the days when you looked for increased VR or a decreased VR and so on. In clinical practice, that becomes not important. But it's enough to say that airway disease has a general chest sign and a parenchymal or a pleural disease are often a localized sign. Even if you just know that, it's like a cardiac murmur. I only remember about my residence days when three top cardiologists from US came to Grand Medical College and we had a flurry of patients shown to them. The only thing I remember was all three of them differed in every case that they saw. <laughs> that gave me a confidence as a clinician because they were topmost cardiologists. And uh, in few patients who died, the diagnosis was the fourth one. All three of them were wrong. I was very happy that a clinician has a great limitation in diagnosing a complex cardiac disease. Then for me, it was simple, complex or simple cardiac disease. Simple was a VSD, ASD, PDA, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis. And a simple synotic heart was a fallows and a rest. And the rest were rested with somebody else. Uh, <laughs> the point is that I, I think you are, you are very few times wrong with this clinical approach. And I would rather take a blood pressure and pick up a coact as a heart disease, which is easy to pick up rather than worry about whether it's a soft systolic member, grade 1, to crescendo, ascendo, dividendo, you know, all that. We had to do it because some examiner wanted those terms. Neither they knew it nor you knew it, but you said it and they were happy. You passed. So I, I think uh, uh, this kind of an approach, therefore, generally would help. Recurrent cough. I think recurrent cough is <coughs> sorry. Recurrent cough is such a common problem, and I feel again, if it's a non-febrile recurrent cough, then do not waste an antibiotic or a chest X-ray. Anterior infection then I think you have to be very clear that no bacterial infections recur without a background cause. And there has to be a background cause. Maybe an enlarged adenoids or tonsils getting infected again and again, or a foreign body there, or a congenital malformation there, whatever. I think the message on this is that recurrent viral infections is the rule of every child who goes to the community. And I keep on telling the parents who bring their children with recurrent viral infection that if your child does not respond with fever, then I think please come back because there is something wrong. Uh, he is immunologically not normal. Uh, it is a normal phase. I think many parents feel that a recurrent viral infection is a, a symptom of a poor immunity. They do not understand that uh, if it was poor immunity, they would not recover. So I always tell them that when I push somebody, if I am strong, relatively he is weak, he will fall down. If I push him ten times, he falls down ten times. It doesn't mean he is weak. How do I find out whether he is weak or strong? I ask him after you fall down, how quickly you get up? Sir, every time I get up quickly. Oh, you are also strong. But you are meeting a stronger fellow who beats you. So the immunity is better considered by the way the child recovers rather than the way the child falls. Child falls because the enemy is strong. Child recovers because he's strong. I think when you put up to the parents like this, they understand. And a common question is, sir, give me something to build up immunity. I tell them immunity is an expertise. Expertise to handle infection is called immunity. How do you become an expert? First exposure. Then a repeated exposure. That is called experience. After some time, expert. So your child is going through that training. He will become an expert after two years. I, I think the point is that Otherwise, you say, yes, yes, his immunity is low. What is immunity low? You don't do CD4, CD8 or some compliment or anything. Okay. And the point is that I think these are the ways that you would be able to convince. Majority of us know what is rationality, but are not able to convey rationality in confidence that the parents want from a clinician. And I think once you are sure this is what it is, I think the rationality is transmitted easily. Otherwise, most of us love to practice rationally, know enough rationality, but are afraid of conveying it to somebody who may not agree to your views and therefore he would be better off with giving that. <clears throat> what about tachypnea? Again, uh, I think uh, Dr. Dagbhushan showed a happy tachypneic child, a happy weezer, and I think it's so important to pick that up. For example, uh, a child who has got a so-called tachypnea may not be dyspneic. 
and may not have a chest retraction and may not produce any sound at all and he is a metabolic acidosis. He is not at all a respiratory or a cardiac problem at all. How simple then it is if you saw a tachypneic child that first look at whether he is dyspneic. And if he is not dyspneic or not retracting his chest, I think you have something else. Then look at what chest retraction. Oh, he is not retracting. Many children with bronchiolitis could breathe 80, 100 times a minute without a chest retraction whatsoever. And then so also metabolic acidosis or a children who have a respiratory muscle paralysis will not just retract. So half of them are not retracting, the others are retracting and they are retracting at different sites to give you a, a clear idea about the site of problem. And then of course they are making different sounds and this fellow is not making any voice also because his chest muscles are paralyzed. So just looking at the dyspnea part, the retraction part and the sound part, I think you could almost know a final diagnosis of a tachypneic child. And I think that is what the observation of a clinician could be, even to pick up that. Acute diarrhea, I think uh, Malti did a wonderful job and I will just react to, it, to say that uh, it's not difficult to pick up a watery stool which doesn't need anything more than ORS and zinc from a, maybe a bacterial stool. Only thing occasionally, I'm sure that in clinical medicine, every time you are fooled occasionally, not usually. And I know children whom I called viral because they had a watery stool, they were not toxic. By day two, day three, they started becoming toxic. They produced mucus, blood, and then you had no kind of face to defend. That is all that you need to. And therefore, when I now look at such children, I would tell the parent, oh, it mostly looks viral, don't worry. We anticipate in the next two days this to happen. If not, we will see. Then you are not wrong. Otherwise, it appears that there will be a next fellow. You called it a viral. By day three, the child is getting toxic, coming out with blood and mucus. It's a bacterial infection. And the next pediatrician said, oh, he missed it. He should have given the first day an antibiotic. Looks very convincing, but totally irrational. And I think we know the several differences between that. Uh, I think besides that, uh, just the type of stool, I'm sure a nutrition matter. Most of the children who come to you in an office practice with good nutrition have rarely to suffer serious bacterial infection. Not that nobody can suffer. But I remember those who have worked in ICU setting for two years, see every one single loose stool as a hemolytic uremic syndrome and, you know, something terribly happening because they have never seen anything not happening. And I think that's where we lose focus. And I'm sure that uh, a person like Malti who talked as a super specialist talked on the ground level. Okay, I'm sure she sees far many more complicated problems, but she also is aware that complications are rare. And she stopped at that and said, if not, then look what else. And I think that's, that's the way we all need to go. And of course, then nutrition, I, I won't go into much details, but we, we must make a habit of taking the weight height and looking at the weight for height and so on. I think it's pathetic to see that most of us probably do not write anything beyond the name of the patient and the drugs given. Name of the patient because you are entitled to at least write that and the drugs because you love to, the parents love to and you have to write that. And the minimum that you write. I think far more information is very much required and I, I would imagine that if we start wanting to practice rationally, we must write down four lines to say why we have diagnosed this and why we are treating this. <clears throat> it's easy to say it's an acute viral infection, give amoxicillin, you will be all right. It's difficult to write acute viral infection and followed by amoxicillin. Somewhere the conscience may pinch, if not, somebody else's conscience will teach you that your conscience should have been pinched. So, point is that, but if you don't write, I'm sure you all have heard this, oh, doctor said it's a viral infection, take this antibiotic, you will be all right. Okay, and you have to be decent not to defend, not to contradict him and say, oh, viral infection, antibiotic, he's talking nonsense. Oh, that's indecent. You can't talk against your colleague. So you have to swallow all that, which means you have to also spread the wrong messages. I think uh, that that's where probably will go by. I think growth problems are very common in children. I think uh, uh, as, as you get more senior, uh, many such problems. See, as you get senior, you see many uh, issues which are not pathological at all. People believe there is a problem and the junior man has said there is no problem and they feel I, I know many people who come to me only because their children are not growing. First thing, they have not monitored the growth at all to say they are not growing. What they mean is they are thin. 
and i think it's always right to explain to them what is so i always tell them what is health health is measured by activity if you are active you must be healthy well you can choose not to be active even if you are healthy but that's a different story children don't do that adults could do that and i think that's a difference between children and adults adults are adulterated when child gets adulterated he is called adult so uh, then he is he is lazy you know he is fit he is healthy but he says no i can't work so hard you know i'm tired a child is not tired to the last step of energy is active i think health is measured by activity time and again i have seen a mother who brings a thin child very active very normal doesn't need investigation it's easy to say you are a normal child and she said but how weak is he i said why do you think he is a weak so he is so thin no so she calls thin as weak only one question asked to her puts everything in order i ask her what about activity oh sir activity i get tired but he does not oh madam that's good you are weak he is not please see your doctor yeah uh, i have never failed in this experiment because every mother comes out instantaneously oh i get tired by evening but this rat does not oh, that's very good i wanted you to say that madam you are weak go to your doctor he is all right so i i think uh, height is a measure of growth and we know that it has a genetic component etc not nutrition you know you want to fire up nutrition totally not to grow and therefore you don't get stunted unless you are wasted and therefore yes i know that you might have a pituitary dwarf and a hypothyroid etc but that's not common scenario and therefore again if you do a weight and height and finally uh, therefore large number of them have a poor weight gain with normal height and normal activity and i think they are constitutional or genetic how would you know them whether they are pituitary dwarfs or whatever i think growth charts and therefore another request that every child that comes to your office you must provide him with a growth chart and tell him that wherever he goes he must have his doctor chart is weight height and head circumference in the first two years and plot it on the chart the chart will tell you so much i mean i have i have heard uh, Uh, the endocrinologist talking about uh, endocrinology without hormones st- assess almost like what dr jain talked and i think uh, uh, the entire growth problems are studied by growth chart you don't need uh, a, a growth hormone assay or whatever and i think we have we have got away from such simple measures and i think we owe to them so just monitor the growth of every child on a growth chart and it's so simple then you pick up a real short stature you just want to do three things a chronological height age and a bone age and i think you don't need a hormonal lab you i'm i'm aware that bone age is not simple if you ask a radiologist a bone age of a 4 year old child he says it between a 1 and 5 now 1 and 5 i also know yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah so good good bone age has to come in weeks uh, not even months and i'm sure that's not easy but yes there are radiologists who will refer to pile charts and give you a correct weekly uh, referred bone age and i think if you just knew this much then you have diagnosed constitutional genetic versus pituitary and thyroid what more do you want i am aware that we are not talking about a secondary growth failures uh, i was most amazed when endocrinology bulletin of iip sub specialty chapter uh, okay that they would carry a growth problem but a gi one carried once an editorial on uh, growth retardation said since when gi people are dabbling with endocrinology was my first impression then they said oh chronic diarrhea celiac syndrome oh all that may come with a stunted growth and you might miss an occasional large stool or abdominal distension or whatever point is that secondary growth uh, problems of course exist but these are the primary growth problems and they are they're so simple to I think don't forget to evaluate development of every child, and you don't have to kind of see the development whole thing. You know that the IIP growth charts now has also a developmental uh, spectrum given that you could do things not exactly at one point but over a spectrum. But I think to me, uh, every three month old whom you see for the second dose of DPT around could have at least looked at a head control, hand to mouth, recognizing mother, social smile, and a babble. and i think if you look just at these five points and said oh everything looks all right what what we want to pick up is something that has gone wrong prenatally or intranatally which could be kind of coming up subtly in terms of developmental delay anything that happened postnatally or obviously an event uh, uh,
caused by some seizure or meningitis or whatever and are not difficult to pick up. But one that have happened earlier, I think at three months we must make a, a, a routine to say, oh, everything is all right. And then uh, if a child cannot sit by one ear or cannot look at you when you call the name of a child, I think he needs an investigation. And then, of course, by 18 months, if he doesn't have a, even a single word, then he is either an autistic ADHD or a global delay or maybe a hearing defect commonly. I think even as general pediatrician, if you look at three years, three months, 12 months, 18 months, I'm sure you are not likely to miss anything that would be considered delayed uh, uh, diagnosis on your end. Because even if you pick up an autistic child at 18 months, you have done wonderfully well. Prior to that, it's not easy to pick up an autism. And I know that Viva Krishnamurti, who is a, one of the excellent developmental pediatrician in Bombay, uh, would tell me at 12, 15 months, if you suspect, I'm also going to watch for the next three months, but be sure thereafter. It's not easy. The point is, we want to pick them up when we are not late enough to intervene. And I thought in a developmental screen, one at three months and 12 months and 18 months is enough. <coughs> a one good look at the sexual development may be worth it because if, if you, uh, you must examine genitals during the first visit, I'm sure. And uh, if you have a palpable testis, you know there is a Y chromosome there. If you have a bilateral cryptorganism in a full term baby, probably I would start investigating. And then you might have uh, some clinical clues of any sex hormone defects or an adrenal defect like craving for salt or maybe a dark pigmented skin like a, a child of a CH with a glucocorticoid deficiency would mean. I think anemia is so common and for a clinician it's easy. Uh, you have only four types of anemia in clinical practice, a deficiency, a hemolytic, hemorrhagic and marrow. <coughs> if you just divide that in your mind and said, what kind of anemia I'm likely to deal with? Uh, most of these are <coughs> deficiency are chronic, hemolytic could be chronic, and a marrow could be chronic. The hemorrhagic is acute, chronic hemorrhagic is really a chronic deficiency. Liver and spleen is not here, there, okay. Whereas in, in an acute hemolytic anemia, it may not be there, chronic it is there, hemorrhage it's not there, marrow in an acute it could be there or not there. Liver and spleen becomes an important focus. <coughs> and then again, as I said, the platelets. And in iron deficiency, the platelets are high, B12, it's low. You, you might have a hypersplenism in a hemolytic anemia and a hemorrhage platelet might go up in a marrow platelet may go down. So I think if you look at the liver spleen platelets and of course then the WBC, for example, you might have a hemolytic anemia where those uh, uh, new, the, the RBCs which are nucleated are read as WBCs and the count is often high and therefore many things would give you a clue. The point is, if you saw somebody pale, <coughs> don't just give him iron, you are right 99%. But how are you going to pick up one? Just be sure that there is no liver insurance or whether it's a coagulation factor. But I think a simple screening test is enough. You don't need any other test at all to diagnose every kind of a hematological disorder that causes bleeding. And a simple platelet count, a PT and PTT, is enough to differentiate all. Now further to branch into what else? is I think a different story but you already made up your diagnosis by very very simple test and add on to a clinical judgment and you would know exactly for example you will have all these three normal when you have a factor 13 deficiency or sometimes a child abuse and so on and so forth the point is that simple tests that are available to majority of us could almost make a final diagnosis of a leading disorder and then uh, when it comes to liver I'm talking in front of a specialist, but I'll tell her how as a general pediatrician I think. Uh, I think gone are the days when we say it's a liver disease. Oh, what does liver disease mean? I'm sure uh, we are a bit uh, better than a layman when we talk about a liver disease. I'm sure many parents come and ask you, I hope his liver is not sluggish. I said, I'll ask Malti whether sluggish liver is a syndrome by itself and what is sluggish? Sluggish thoughts on the mind of a physician. That is a sluggish liver. What is sluggish liver? Is it walking slow or is it functioning slow? Uh, and I'm sure uh, many children who don't eat, you say liver is at fault. I look at the liver with a little more microanatomical detail and I, I feel this becomes very useful clinically. When I have a liver disease, I ask my postgraduate, what do you mean? Is it a hepatocyte disease? Is it a biliary tract disease? Is it a vascular disease of the liver? 
or is it really a reticle only tell itself? And I think that's where you start branching and say, otherwise a mere hepatomegaly may be a symptom of any kind of a problem in the liver. And I think uh, to me, therefore, if you have a hepatocyte disease, well, you have a metabolic problems, you have an, uh, certainly a biochemical thing. If it's a biliary tract, uh, we all have learned a kind of an artificial difference between neonatal hepatitis and a biliary atresia, though we know it's the same spectrum uh, in a different manifestation. But we did know inherently that a child of a neonatal hepatitis looks sicker, a child of biliary atresia doesn't look sick. But we did not correlate to say that a oh, child of biliary atresia is looking not sick because his hepatocytes are normal. Well, at the end, everything will be hepatobiliary. And therefore, if you want to be sure, call it hepatobiliary, but for which you have to wait for a liver disease to get worse. Otherwise, call it a biliary or a hepatic. And then, of course, you might have a, a, a the portal venous or a systemic venous problem. And then you might have, of course, a reticular endothelial so hyperplasia. For example, you might have a large liver with a normal liver function. And you know it's not a hepatocyte disease or it's not a biliary tract disease and so on. And I feel uh, going down a little more uh, would be uh, almost of great use. And uh, uh, al almost similar to a nephrology. I'm sure we have a nephrologist here. And I think time has come to say, what kidney disease? A glomerular disease or a tubular disease? A nephrologist will say, what tubular disease? A proximal distal loop of Henle collecting tubules. Oh, he is going beyond you. But at least you can talk about glomerular and a tubular disease. And makes a lot of sense for a clinician to take away majority of the chunk of the clinical practice that you see. And after all, then what glomerular diseases that you see? You see an acute nephritis, you see a nephrotic syndrome, and you see a UTI. If you knew that, 95% of your job is well done. And a tubular diseases of some kind, an RTA that you should not miss, proximal distal. Fine, there is far more complicated. That's why they learn nephrology for so many years. But we would learn 90% in the small span. Why spend so much time? Small span, lot of things. You heard multi. I almost thought I'm a good GI liver man today. And then I became a good neonatology man. Then a respiratory man. Oh, wonderful. In one CME, you are a super specialist. Close to. Yeah, not a bad idea. Uh, I, I think when you see somebody whose leg is a little flail, uh, and then you are worried what it is, I think an anterior horn cell, a nerve, or a muscle is again not very, very difficult clinically. I'm sure when I tell this to my pediatric neurologist, they say, don't make it that simple, it is very complicated. Who wants complicated? Complicated is a problem is one where super specialist also does not understand. Simple is one when anyone can understand. So why not be simple? So I, I think majority of times such uh, issues probably settle down quickly. Otherwise, we always have had a problem how to go out. I was talking about a nephrology and I feel where I have learned, uh, everywhere I go, uh, I, I like to sit through because I learn so much and I feel that now that I have gone through 40 years, I have yet a lot to learn. Uh, now nephrologists have certainly told us that it's a GFR that is a concept that has to get into a mind. What serum creatinine? Serum creatinine will get uh, abnormal only when you are dying. Okay, much before that a GFR. GFR will come down from 80 to almost 30 ml. Uh, before your serum creatinine rises. I think such concepts that we hear from our super specialists are, are pearls of wisdom for a generalist <coughs> to go by. And I'm, I'm sure UTI, uh, standard protocols of IAP. I think very clear when to do an MCU, when to do a DMSH scan, when to use a profile access, all that. And I think we are very, very clear now that UTI is an emergency. And UTI is a serious problem. And a UTI cannot be just driven away with some antibiotic. In fact, no child of fever should receive an antibiotic unless you are sure what you are dealing with. And I'm sure UTI is something easily missed, uh, missed again and again. And I recall in my own practice, having seen a chronic renal failure out of a child who gets fever every now and then and happily treated by a pediatrician with an antibiotic. So I think we have gone a long way from then and said that urinalysis is a must. A urine culture ideal, <clears throat> but not giving an antibiotic is a rational before you know what it is. And UTI won't die if you delayed a diagnosis by a day or two. But he could die if you just got him well without knowing what you did. And I think these are some of the things, and as I said, that uh, the GFR 
And when you talked about glomerular filtration rate, <coughs> I'm sure many of you must be like me. When you when you are confronted with lot of biochemistry and metabolic thing, you know you shun away and you say that's not my cup of tea. To understand why sodium keeps outside and potassium inside and sodium potassium pump and all, I knew that those terms are excellent to impress somebody else. Not that those who use also know much about it. But nowadays they say, oh, it's a channelopathy. I say, what channel? And what pathy? Pathological channels. Yeah, uh, I'm sure the neurologists have a lot of channelopathy to diagnose. And then you say mitochondrial disease, a problem with sodium potassium pump. I know only water pump that's available outside. What these pumps? Uh, it makes me quite uncomfortable, but I don't need to be. <clears throat> to know GFR, you don't have to do fancy studies. You have to only take the length or a height of a child and order a serum creatinine and have a, a fixed point. 5, 5 or 5, 5, whatever. And I think uh, work out your GFR. I think let's start looking at the GFR, not at serum creatinine alone, when next time you are looking at the uh, renal profile. And lastly, I think uh, all of us see uh, a baby first time in life. Many of them are small babies. And I feel these are the things that you miss so often. And I'm sure our uh, neonatologists would agree that uh, these are very, very commonly missed. And I would see a child at uh, one year uh, whose CDH is diagnosed and the parents ask me, when, when do you think it must have developed? I would say, no, difficult to say. <laughs> you know, why say from birth? <laughs> okay, he say, I don't know, but it's there. Okay, but I, I also know that the imperforate anus was diagnosed on day three when I was called to see a child with an abdominal distension. And you ask a nurse in charge, meconium, yeah, meconium passed. Because normally you say no meconium. You pass you pass that question itself. What meconium? Okay. And meconium what pass? Imperforate anus, abdominal distension. Okay. I said before you ask for a chest x-ray to see what intestinal obstruction, at least let's look at the anal opening. And there was no opening at all. I had to tell the obstetrician to say, look, there's no anal opening at all. And what do I tell the parent? They would ask me, when did it close down, you know? So, yeah, I, I mean, you have to protect your colleagues. You can't go there. Oh, they have missed for last three days. They have missed is all right, but you, you kind of make it appear that it's not all that many. Sometimes it's difficult to see an anal opening in a small newborn. That's how you should put it. The point is that, you know, co -op. I I know many times when the child is in cardiac failure or a, a, a little poor peripheral perfusion, you don't feel a, even a sometimes a femoral, you start feeling your own pulses there. It's not easy. And then, of course, looking at genital, I, I know in an MD exam, once when I was an examiner, <clears throat> a newborn with a, a cleft palate was kept for exam. And a poor chap had missed a cleft palate. It's easy to miss a cleft palate because normally you have to use your mouth wide open. And who uses wide open mouth? Adults like me who keep on talking with a wide mouth. Newborn doesn't, keeps quiet, wisdom, keeping quiet, listening to others, not talking. Okay, left palate missed. I think these are very genital. I think you rarely look at the genitals on a clinical examination, a lumbosacral spine. But once a cardiologist told me that you must also see on a discharge on day three, day four, that the pulmonary second sound is split. I said, this is too much of a split of my thinking because it was so difficult. I want Dr. Jain to tell us whether it can be. He said a persistence of right the, the uh, right ventricle and a second sound not split. We oh, already, already diagnosed a kind of a phallus physiology right on day three. Wonderful. I knew that he had seen a echocardiogram and then looked back at the pulmonary second sound. <laughs> that would have been easy, but not otherwise. Well, uh, Prince, I would just end up by saying that in each system, you try to pick up your own way of organizing your thoughts on how to make a diagnosis. And I think even if you have, you've got your own algorithm, it needs to be tested. I'm sure it needs to be. Uh, and once you get a hang of it, probably you get more confident. Somebody like now younger people generation must validate all that we said. But I'm sure majority of times it would work well. Until it's validated, I keep on using uh, in my own practice. Thank you very much.